five nights in a row of less than your requisite seven to nine hours, whatever it is, you can lower your insulin sensitivity by as much as 50%. Yeah. Wow. And for most people that are worried about body composition, that's all they need to hear. Yeah. Although yeah. there's a myriad of reasons why you should get enough sleep, but that will get their attention. Yeah. Right? They've heard that testosterone can get their energy back, their libido back, help with body composition. And in the 90 day follow up, they say, and by the way, doc, I'm sleeping so much better. Yeah. And you go, yeah. When, when you used to wake up at, when you were 20 years old and think about some of these things, what would you do? Shut up, brain. I'll handle it when I wake up in the morning. Now, if you're short in some of these hormones, especially the feel good, the confidence, you know, the joie de vivre hormone, you wake up almost like, you, you know, when you have the flu and you feel kind of crappy, the world sucks. Well, 14 days later, you feel better. The world hasn't changed, but the world's great again. Yeah. You know, it was you. With the hormones being off, is my point, particularly testosterone, which again is that feel good and confidence hormone, you can have trouble sleeping. And so you fix that and bingo, you know, mm -hmm. everything works again. That one thing can lead to another, as I said earlier, and vice versa. If you regulate your testosterone, if it's dysregulated, then sometimes that can solve all your sleep problems. And if you're not getting enough sleep and you thereby dysregulate your thyroid, your testosterone, your cortisol, well, then you can have more issues and, and you know, the snowball effect. So you're watching Dr. Rand McLean, author of Cheating Death. This guy is the expert on things like hormone therapy, peptide therapy, and other ways to live better and live longer. So the rest of the episode is pretty awesome. Can't wait for you to hear it. Also, we're going to give away a program right now. MAPS Anabolic is the giveaway. And if you want to win, here's what you do. Leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop it. Subscribe to this channel, turn on notifications. If we declare the winner, we'll let you know in the comment section. We're also running a sale on some programs right now. These are correctional exercise, pain relieving, pro mobility workout programs. MAPS Prime, MAPS Prime Pro, and the Prime Bundle, all 50% off. If you're interested, just click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, back to the show. Dr. Rand, welcome back to the show. Always Thanks. great having you on. You're definitely uh, one of our favorite, uh, if not absolute favorite people uh, to talk to when it comes to hormones, longevity, health. Um, you know, we, we respect the hell out of you and you wrote a book and we want you to talk about this book because it's pretty awesome. The title of it's awesome. It gets your attention. Get it. it gets your Definitely. attention. Cheating death. Yeah. Let's yeah. talk. So who's this book written for? Why'd you write this book? And then we can kind of get into some of the stuff that you've learned and the research that you cite and talk about in the book. First question I haven't really answered yet before, but who's it written for? It's written for anyone who wants to take control of their health. So, um, the, the message of the book is really letting people know what's out there so that you can take advantage of your health. Uh, I use the example of myself in the book in that, you know, medicine was advancing so quickly that when I had some of my medical challenges, for example, with the spine, and they offered me really the option between uh, a, a fusion and what amounted to kind of a advanced door hinge as a replacement for the disc, I said, no way, man, I'm not, I'm not doing it. And, uh, you know, 33 years later, I had a pretty serious result from not doing anything about it. And in between there, if I had paid more attention and known how quickly we're, we were advancing, I would have had a lot more, um, well, opportunities to, to, to fix it and be better off than I am today. Mm -hmm. I'm not complaining where I am today, but I, I had other options that uh, I had no idea about. So the idea of the book is to let people know that there are so many options for, uh, increasing health span, we call it, right? Not just longevity, but the quality of life while we're living. And uh, the, the, so the purpose is to spread the word in that regard. And then um, obviously as part of that, give people the sense that, um, well, first of all, you should be your own best advocate for your health, but that you have the ability to control it. And there's some, there's some um, uh, ideas in the book as to how you can do it, not just theoretically, but some practical information there too. I hope that people awesome. take advantage of it. Yeah. So you're, I mean, you're obviously a medical doctor and you've been doing this for a little while. And it seems to me, I have a lot of friends in the, in the field. I have a lot of clients that were doctors and I noticed there were, that especially more recently, maybe over the last um, two, maybe two and a half decades where Western medicine, which gets a lot, they get a lot of heat, but a lot of credit for this. They do a good job of treating symptoms not a lot of, not a great job at looking at kind of chronic issues or looking at things like longevity or quality of life necessarily. Seems like we're starting to see advancements in that space where it's like, okay, yeah, we have these great ways to kind of make you feel better right now, 
but there seems to be a lot of research going into now longevity or health span. First of all, how do we define the two? What do you mean by longevity versus health span? Because you, you said those two. Is, well, is health span combines the idea of longevity with quality of life. No one wants to go into their older age spiraling down the you know proverbial toilet, just hanging in there to the last moment. We want to do what we used to call squaring the curve so that you're going along like you did you know, in your 20s or roughly thereabouts. And then, you know, somewhere in your hundreds, you know, you die in your sleep if you're lucky, right? But still going strong. Um, and that's that's doable to date. Uh, we're looking at old news where you see the, you know, your best time, let's say, is here when you're 20. And then it creeps up a little bit until you get to 70. And then hockey sticks. But I think that's moving. I think if you looked at data today, it'd probably be closer to 85. And you see the examples in the in the press now where, you know, people are doing some pretty amazing stuff, whether it's on the, 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 the gymnast bar of some sort or on the track, you know? Um, so again, the idea is to, uh, well, I hopefully define health span, right? Mm -hmm. So, so it's not just being alive. It's actually being able to be functional being healthy, independent. And alive, yeah. yeah. And being able to function, enjoy life. Uh, I've never met a patient who says, yeah, let me trade one for the other in terms of longevity for uh, quality of life. It's usually the other way around. They'll come in and asking for, hey, what do you got? I'll take 10 off the back end if you can give me three more before I go. You know, No. Mm. And that's the beauty of this is, and, and I try and make it clear in the book, it's really, it's definitely not a Rob Peter to pay Paul situation. It's really one is advancing the other. Certainly if you're in better health, you're expected to live longer, right? If you don't have uncontrolled type two diabetes, not only will your life be better, but it should last longer too. So that's pretty exciting. I mean, from, from, I think anyone in this room standpoint, how, how valuable or how accurate I should say, do you think the, the tests are that give us our, you know, biological and chronical age are those pretty accurate or is that a pre-planned question? Because yeah, <laughs> um, well, I'm a lot of people are working on that. I've got an app, which is up in its first iteration that gives people based on the, you know, the, the, um, in Haines, um, database that we have, which is pretty huge. Anyway, correlation between, um, some of these markers and biological age, what we're estimating is biological age is always going to be an estimate until many, many generations, because we got to live through those to be able to verify the data. Right. But we're doing a pretty good job. It's certainly at advanced levels, uh, at advanced level with things like, um, DNA methylation that comes up pretty accurately, uh, to measure chronological age. And then, of course, we associate the two and we can come up with a biological age estimate. Telomere length um, probably comes in, uh, in second place. Uh, depending upon how you measure it, uh, something called HQ fish is, I think, the only way it's worth measuring if you're trying to get a decent estimate of biological age. But the point being, we can come up with it. And any, even if we're not accurate, you know, the idea, especially with what you guys are doing, think about it, what we're all trying to do. If I'm 60 and it says I'm 62, but then we can implement an exercise program that ratchets things up and knowing what we know about, you know, uh, downregulating mTOR and upregulating uh, autophagy. If we can measure again in, in uh, six months to a year and go, hey, now it says you're 61, I don't care so much about the age as I do. Hey, I'm doing the right things and I'm moving in the right direction. You're this is, this yeah. is how we explain people, explain to people not to get so hung up on some of these tools or let's say a, a, um, body fat measurement readings where they're like, oh, I heard that's off by 4% or this one's better than that one. It's like, none of it really matters that much. It's like, what matters is that you have a baseline that tells you this is your body fat percentage and then the things that you put into place, did you go up, did you go down? And so I think the same thing would probably be true with this. It's like getting that that reading so you at least have an idea that, okay, I'm now mm -hmm. gonna go out and implement these new behaviors or supplementation or exercise re or regimen. And then I'm gonna come back and retest and say six months in a year. And hopefully I'm trending in the right direction. And if I'm not, I probably need to correct something. And think about what a great motivator that is. I mean, it's not to say that people don't trust you or us and what we're saying, or grandma, eat plenty of colors, uh, you know, put plenty of colors on your plate when you eat. And like, it's now beyond trust. It's happening, I can, I can measure it. And it just leads to, I'm telling you guys what you already know, right? Compliance. Mm -hmm. They see it happening. They're much more likely to follow through rather than just go, yeah, well, he told me so. Again, even if it's subconscious, people are coming to you for advice. Mm -hmm. They trust you to begin with, but this really drives it home, right? 
Yeah. I think like a simplistic way for me to look at it is when I go to like a, a reunion and you you notice like everybody there is the same age, but you can see like a drastic difference, especially over the years, how their health has diminished on one end versus like people that are really like humming right now in terms of the quality of life and, you know, hitting all those markers. But now to have something to sort of quantify that, I think that's interesting for people to, to look into that further and like how we can kind of base that off of like some of those markers that you're mentioning. And so to test that. Yeah. It's like, uh, we all know that person who's 70, who's like, man, they're like, it's like they're 50. Like they're, they, they look like they're 50. They move like they're 50. And then we all know that 50 year old. They're like, Oh, they're, <laughs> it's like they're 90 years old. They can barely function. So it's really biological age is like how young your body is, um, on a cellular level, essentially, right. To to, to define it loosely, how well things are working and moving versus just on the calendar, how old you are, right? Would that, would you say that? And arguably it's for everybody, but for the person you're talking about, who's 70, but working like he or she's 50, it's added motivation. If you think about it, do I need a biological age to, to, to motivate somebody like that? Or if I'm that person, um, if you're 70, but moving like you're 50, it's the functional day to day that makes all the difference to you. So do I need a number? But for those people, arguably, yes, because it gives them that much more drive. They're already doing well, Mm -hmm. but for someone who, I don't want to say might be more likely to take advantage of it, but for someone who's obviously doing it right to begin with, if they're trying to squeeze that last percentage out, mm-hmm. it gives them more, even more feedback, I guess. Yeah. Well, too, in the person that maybe is a little bit more on the less able-bodied, like less healthy version, to, to try, they're always out there trying to ask them what they're doing. Like, what are you doing? How are you so vibrant? How are you so healthy? And to, to be able to then kind of uh, go in and test and figure out ways that they can improve their health and their quality of their health and like sort of reduce that. Uh, biological number, I guess, down would be, you know, something yeah. I, I could see people wanting to get into that. Now, as, as, a, as a fitness professional, I, I'm going to make a couple assumptions and I'd love your input. I would assume that the most impactful things on, by, on chronological, or excuse me, biological age have to do with like exercise, diet, and sleep. Those are the most important ones. Yeah. And we go back to your question about the purpose behind the book and what's in there. We've all heard that forever, sure. right? Those three th- pillars are yeah. huge and you could throw in uh, Maybe lifestyle it, stress or whatever. Well, yeah, and and part of that is you know, uh, well, humans. So so bonding and and uh, interaction with oh, people and stuff, yeah, exactly. relationships, and that gets kind of woo woo, uh, but not so much anymore. If you look at the research, the data's plenty, clear. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Um, so that I, I, you could throw that in as a fourth pillar for sure, but we've all heard the the, the other three forever. And it gets kind of old to, I mean, you see your, your clients out there, right? My patients. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. What else you got? <laughs> Talk to me about peptide. <laughs> what kind of pill? What kind of other thing? What's the cool latest? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the purpose of the book was to go into the research. Like there's plenty of with relationships and stuff, but to show, look, sleep, it's not just what great grandma said, you know, nutrition ditto and, and exercise ditto let me explain some of the research or present it to you and explain it as much as you need it explained to show you that it's not just, you know, a, a, a legend, a, a myth, whatever you want to call it. It's real. And I think that makes it more interesting, particularly in this day and age with the people we're dealing with that are much more interested in want, Hey, I, I want to see just like, Hey, show me the research on the peptides. Okay. I want to see evidence and it makes it easier to circle back, I've found, and say, hey, before we start talking about fine-tuning or sniping with, yeah. with the peptides, let's get back to the basics. Because, you know, I, I remember seeing guys in my office with the cooler of food, the jug of, of uh, distilled water, ran, I'm doing everything right, you know, <laughs> but I can't uh, get leaner. I can't put on more muscle. And I'm going, okay. Talk to me. We find out that, yeah, their exercise routine looks brilliant. They got that wired. They're carrying the nutrition with them. You know, they're eating every three hours and it looks pristine. What else? Well, I work for UPS and two other things, you know, and where I come from, we say working like a Jamaican, mm-hmm. you know, hardworking. So it's a 16 hour day just with work. And then they're getting four hours sleep. Hello, (laughs) you know, and they're wondering because they don't understand. They go, well, yeah, but I've gotten away with this for years. That's probably something you guys see a lot of. So yeah, that can't be it. 
No, it is it. You go back to the basics and then you convince them and all of a sudden, boom, everything takes off. And it's that simple. Now, these those categories are broad, right? I mean, we spent our entire careers talking about those categories. So what does the data say on nutrition? Let's get nutrition because there's so many different ways you can eat. There's so many different diets that are out there. This one's better than that one or whatever. What does the data show um, with diet in terms of uh, longevity or health span? What is it saying? The data shows you can't rely on the data. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, this is a part of what I present in the book, and it's no uh, new news to most guys that are out there doing like you do. One of my favorites came out recently. Have you guys heard of this guy, um, Ross Edgley? No, I don't know. I have. Yeah, I have. Yeah, I have, yeah, I have. Him, yeah. So I ran into him just fairly recently, but I, I've already read two of his books because what I like about his approach as a doer, not just somebody standing here yeah. talking about it, is you know the guy swam around yeah, uh, this, Britain, right? Yeah. Oh, he yeah, climbed yeah. via rope the 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 height of Everest. So he's clearly a doer, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, there is no one diet that fits all. Okay, and that's the point. Most of the research that um, we see is is epidemiological in nature. It's observational and retrospective. For example. It's based on uh, forms you fill out. That, 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 well, no, I'm serious. I know, I know. Hey, these. What, what have you eaten over the last year? Yeah. Do you remember what you ate? I can't tell Forget you. Forget about the last <laughs> Thursday. Last yesterday? Yeah. yeah, yesterday, right? You know? Not the week before. Forget about it. So it creates a lot of problems and a lot of data that comes out false because it can be so easily manipulated with bias. You know, uh, I, I, I never did well at statistics because, well, long story, but um, – it really does come down to that. And there's so many flaws that you wouldn't think about intuitively, but that come up when you look at the research. So I would say, and there's guys out here, uh, out there that have studied this. One of my favorites, again, is Peter Atia. Yeah. And then uh, Dr. Ioannidis, uh, who really first spoke out and said, hey, guys, most of the info we have here is garbage. Uh, I think he, he's, he's quoted as over 90%. So to answer wow. your question, first of all, throw out the data. You can use some of the diets like we all, you know, so many of them now, ketogenic diet, you know, the carnivore diet, the Mediterranean diet. Start with one as a basis to figure out what works for you and tweak it as necessary. Uh, you may throw it completely out. Carnivore doesn't work for a lot of people. My wife would be one. I mean, she's one of those freaks of nature that lives on carbohydrates. I mean, she could probably survive and still perform well on Twizzlers from what I've seen, right? <laughs> I mean, she's a freak of nature. But that's to the point that you can't just say, okay, this is what works for everybody. Now, there are some that do have some decent science behind it, like the Mediterranean diet. And uh, God, I always forgot his name. I don't mean to be disrespectful, but the, the, there's a doctor out there that promotes it really well, or his version of it. And we know that it lowers LDL and can help with people that have extant coronary artery disease. Well, but that, that applies to certain individuals doesn't mean that everybody needs to be on that diet because everybody didn't have coronary artery disease. Yeah. To, right? well, to, to, to back you up, I mean, um, in terms of what you're saying with the data, Dr. I think Ansel Keys was his name, came up with the Seven Nations study where we based our nutrition, our government nutritional advice um, that demonized fat, right? So he took a bunch of data from all these countries, literally took out the three countries that didn't fit the data <laughs> yeah, and exactly. said, it's fat, right? Took the countries out that lived a long time that ate a lot of fat. It's classic example. Classic. And it became like this anti-fat campaign. Obviously, we got fatter and sicker, so it didn't help anybody. Um, we noticed as trainers and coaches that there's this huge individuality when it comes to diets. <clears throat> We're now seeing this with CGMs, right? Continual glucose monitors where... I can eat a food that's low on the glycemic index and get a crazy insulin, you mm -hmm. know, uh, you know, glucose spike, and someone else will get this wonderful glucose spike. Uh, I've seen people get glu glucose spikes from foods that don't even have sugars and carbohydrates because they had some kind of immune response. So to kind of back you up, um, that's absolutely true. Are there general truths, though, that you're seeing? Like, don't overeat, avoid... Don't eat large quantities of arsenic. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Solid. There's some obvious ones. I mean, yeah, whole but there's foods, also some like... ones that you go, man, I wouldn't think that's obvious, or you, or, or, or vice versa. You, you know, you really just have to experiment within reason to see what works best for you. And then you have to also throw in there... What works for me while I'm training for endurance versus yeah. while I'm training for muscle yep. mass or leaning out? Uh, if it's winter versus summer, if I'm on the equator, and I know it sounds kind of esoteric, but it's true. No, very true. You know, are you going to eat the same when you're freezing your butt off in Chicago in the winter as you would in Ecuador, winter or summer? Yeah. You know, so 
And then, the, and then, then you got it all figured out, right? For each individual. And then you age another couple of years and you go, okay, my body's not working the same anymore. <laughs> so you really just have to, to go back to, okay, be your best advocate and observe, observe, observe. Yeah. And, and be aware of all these factors that come into play and maybe some that don't, you know, like whether I wear blue in the morning for my t-shirt, I don't think that has an, it has anything to do with my, my diet. So I'm just making the point that, you know, you got to also exclude some of the stuff that a lot of people are touting is this is very, very important. Yeah. Not really. Dr. Rand, again, to back you up, people in cold, traditional cold, freezing climates, if you look at the traditional diets, high in things like cod yeah. liver. Yeah, I'll make it. The Inuits. Yeah. Very, yeah. Yeah. very high in vi vitamin D. Got to get that yeah. vitamin D. Where, where they're not getting it from the sun, right? Um, and people who live at the equator, the traditional diets are very different as well. So what you're saying is, I, I love that you're saying this. I'd like to ask you then personal with diet because you're super active. You do the strength training. You also do the long endurance training. You also need to have a lot of cognitive performance, obviously, with your job and presenting yourself on podcasts and stuff. Does your diet vary <laughs> between those? Have you found for yourself that you eat, like to eat for maximum performance with stamina versus muscle mass versus cognitive performance, or is it all generally the same for you? That's a tough one to answer because uh, I was blessed with a mom who got interested in nutrition very, very early. So I grew up on, I always joke on wheat germ pancakes. Oh. Right? <laughs> um, and we were allowed candy on Halloween. That was it, you know, mm. that kind of thing. So I'm not sure if it was something I just got lucky and, and paid attention to early. One of the first books I ever read, I was 11 years old, meaning not mandatory, you know, see Jane run and all that kind of stuff yeah. was, was a nutrition book. Adele Davis is one of her books. And I was fascinated by the fact that you could, you could affect yourself with nutrition. So I don't know if I glommed onto that or not, but I really just kind of go on gut is what I'm saying. So, you know, did I purposely study it? Yeah. Is that now sort of ingrained and I don't even think about it, but to answer your question, not so technically, I eat whatever I want, but it's definitely based upon how I'm feeling. And typically, for example, I'll eat more vegetables and, and even starchy carbs in the summer months where it's hot. Mm. And I tend to burn more fuel just, you know, cause it's, it's hot active, you right. know? and whatever I'm doing, I'm going to be maybe burning more calories. Although uh, you could argue, well, what about in the cold? Well, yeah, if I lived in Chicago again, no, no, nothing against Chicagoans. I love it up there, but uh, you know, I don't, I live in, in Malibu. So I'm not dealing with super cold weather. So I don't have to change my diet to compensate for the cold, mm. like some, a Chicagoan would. So I'm not going to be eating a lot of, uh, calorie dense foods, but I will adjust. I'll eat more protein depending on what I'm doing. And, you know, uh, you mentioned, I, so I'm, um, screwing up my training by doing both a lot of endurance with, with, uh, weightlifting training. Um, and if you don't eat really carefully with that, you're in trouble. So I listen and I go, okay, boy, I can just, I crave that steak, which is most times anyway, but you know, uh, <laughs> and I'll eat it. So God, God I'm giving you a long way to answer. That's not really good, but I think with enough time, if you do what we're talking about, where you pay attention to what you're eating and what it does for you, you'll just get that sort of innate, innate sense of what to eat and when. And we all do that to some degree. When you're in the pink, right? Meaning when you're when you're in good shape, yeah. there's no question what your next meal is going to be. If you have any control, right? Yeah. You don't look at that chocolate cake and go, wow, that looks great. You yeah. look at that and go, God, I'm going to feel like crap yeah. in 30 minutes if I eat that. Because you already feel good and you know that you're in tune with it, right? Good point. I know it sounds kind of woo woo, but it, no, we all we all sense that, right? No, you're right. what you're what you're alluding to right now is the area that we're always trying to guide our clients to, which is becoming more aware of the natural signals that your body tells you. Unfortunately, I think most people are so disconnected to that because we're so distracted and we're so out of our bodies that we don't. But when you get to a place where you have practiced this, you've measured it, you've tried different things, diet, and you start to piece together, oh, wow, when I eat like this, I sleep really well. Oh, wow, when I eat like this, my training session is really well. When you start to make those connections and you do it for long enough like you have, it becomes intuitive. It comes to a point where it's like- You, you crave say, what you need. Yeah, you crave yeah. what you need and you don't deny that. Or you look at a food like a chocolate cake and go, Oh yeah, it smells good, looks nice with that, but I also know how that will make me feel. And as much as that sounds tempting right now to do that, I know how my body will react to it. So it's not worth it. So you, it's easier to pass on it when you've learned that. I think the challenge that a lot of people have today is being in themselves, being connected to their body and actually paying attention to those signals. To drive that point home, to go back to this, this fellow I was mentioning earlier, Ross Edgley, uh, you know, he, I think he loves cheesecake, if I remember correctly. So he eats tons of cheesecake, but he's also swimming around 
Brit Britain yeah. in five yeah. degree centigrade water, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Swimming 12 hours a day, demanding 10 to 15,000 calories a day. So he needs that's not messing with him. Right. So that cheesecake is actually going ding, 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 yeah. dense calories. I need it. I don't need my alfa alfa alfalfa it. sprouts and broccoli right now, right? Yeah. It, it's, it's, it's a waste of my GI space. So you can take that to the extreme, but it, it, and it just, I think, drives your point home even further that it is all relative. And you just have to pay attention. And there are studies talking about being in tune or not. When you're out of tune because of like allergies, no matter how hard you try sometimes, can throw you off. A lot of times, particularly food allergies, you will choose the food that you're allergic to over something you're not. And is that driven by the allergy or what happens as a result of the allergy, the, the, the change in your gut microbiome or whatever? We're not sure yet, but all the more reason to stay on track and be in the pink so your body's working properly than when you get out of sync and you're making wrong choices because you're out of sync. Yeah, there's two there's two theories behind that, by the way. You just said, I just actually literally uh, last week read about that. They think it's either A, you're more likely to develop an intolerance to foods that you repeatedly eat because maybe you have a d damaged gut. So it's like, why am I attracted to this food that's making me say, like, well, I've always been eating it. And because I have a damaged gut, my body's now developed an immune response to it. Then the other theory was the cortisol spike people get addicted to. It's like that stress, those stress mm -hmm. junkies. So they get that stress response. And for some reason it develops this kind of- Or even a histamine reaction, which yes. will pump you up too, right? That's right. Histamine yeah. will do that. Absolutely. All right. So let's talk about exercise. Uh, what about the data on exercise and health span and longevity? Um, obviously being active is better than not being active. But when we get more of the specifics, what, it, what does it say about um, strength training, cardiovascular or extreme exercise versus moderate exercise? What do, you, what do you see in that regard? A lot in that question, but exercise is definitely key. Mm -hmm. The very definition of life includes, you know, the word movement, right? By just about any definition of life itself. So we know that movement's important. Exercise is important. It, 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 uh, it starts the process that I get into in much more detail in the book, whether it's regard, with regard to mTORC, one or two complex, uh, the sirtuin genes, autophagy, uh, so exercise is what I call the great equalizer because it can make up for a lot. For example, in med school, you know, you'd be pulling 36 hours at a time back in those days you could. And before me, you know, it was unlimited how, how much they could push you. Um, they put limits on that now, right? You can't, they, they, they won't hmm. out, out overwork their students like they used well, to. Of course, I'm going to say it this way because I did it before. So <laughs> like, it's kind of candy ass now, but it really isn't. It's, it's still nuts the way they do it. Okay, really, it, it's, 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 it's counter to what we know in medicine is the proper way to do things. And we still do it wrongly. But anyway, um, you know, I'd still grab a workout because if nothing else, it helps with metabolic dysfunction. That's the linchpin for, you know, the four horsemen of disease these days, uh, arguably. And, and um, again, I call it the great equalizer because it does so much for you when done properly. Now you can overtrain and that hormesis yeah. uh, curve comes into play. Some people call it a J curve where, you know, uh, a little bit is good or, or not good. You know, uh, medium amount is great and too much is not good again. Um, I think we, we tease it into different categories. Pretty much the research tends to, to point to, you got to do a little bit of zone two and below. Okay, the gardening, the stuff they, they talk about where you can talk to a friend comfortably. Just full senses, Right. And then you have to do some hit, you know, zone five, high zone four, low or mid zone five, right? Or maxed out. And um, the two of those are, are, are the combination you need because they both are different kinds, obviously, of exercise. They do different things for you. And then when it comes down to measurement again, we can correlate muscle strength and VO2 max with longevity and health span as well as uh, muscle mass. And of course you go, well, muscle mass. And it's a proxy for strength typically, right? Uh, I think it's more than that because, okay. you know, a muscle, for example, I call it a metabolic liability. You know, it's a muscle, it's a sugar sink, we can call it, oh, right? right? It helps with that metabolic dysfunction. Sure. If you're carrying an extra muscle mass and you do go off and indulge in that chocolate cake, which by the way, we should every once in a while for the <laughs> other part of it, just the mental part, right? We should have got a chocolate cake. You brought up like <laughs> We will after this. Goodness. Actually, I skipped it last night for some reason. I don't Grinding know why. But um, <laughs> maybe because I was waiting for it today. No, uh, the... Um, there are uh, divisions that we can look to and whether you're above the anaerobic threshold or not uh, that contribute 
to your health in different ways. And so we need a little bit of both. I would say, arguably, if you were forced to choose between the two, which I hope no one is, that the long, slow distance is going to be considered more important. Uh, just getting around, even if it's just gardening or going for a walk. Yeah. Uh, but if you can do the hit as well, I think the combination, you know, the science bears out and who cares what I think, I, I, you know, the, the, the science shows that you're going to be best off and it's going to hit those three mass strength and VO2 max. Yeah. When I did the research for my book, um, I was actually, I knew the benefits of exercise, but in particular, I wrote about strength training and I was shocked at the impact that strength training and muscle mass had on uh, blood glucose and insulin sensitivity, like by itself, the most effective way of uh, helping to modulate how your body uh, is, uses insulin and, and, and glucose, which is a huge problem in modern societies. I mean, there's, so, you know, now they're finding even Alzheimer's are starting to say, hey, maybe that type three diabetes theory is true that the brain is not able to utilize glucose properly. Definitely um, comes into play the more we dig into Alzheimer's research or any neurological disorder. Absolutely. And uh, you've got, what, 100 million Americans, they estimate, have fatty liver now, whether yeah. it's diagnosed or not. So, yeah. And I've, I've God, I remember 15 years ago, uh, one of the first times I put two and two together, um, and I can tell he's, he, he's on uh, the internet, made his public. His name is Jim Demetz. I remember he was on insulin. He was about 360, you know, 6'3", 6'4", 360, overweight, clearly. Um, and uh, in short, we put a bunch of muscle on him. Got him off insulin. I got wow. him off all diabetic drugs whatsoever. Uh, he's a life coach now somewhere out there, uh, you know, spreading the word because of just what you're saying. Just wow. getting the muscle mass on, increasing insulin sensitivity, you know, fasting insulin levels, dropping his uh, his, his blood glucose, and he's, he's 100%. That's you know? awesome. God bless him wherever he is now. Now, okay, sleep. We're going to touch all the pillars before we yeah. get into the stuff I know everybody wants to hear about, which is like supplements, and peptides, and all this. But we yeah. need to focus on this first. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, so sleep. What, what about, what does the data say on sleep? Now, we all hear the whole <clears throat> seven to eight hours a night, and there needs to be a certain percentage in this REM stage of sleep or whatever. What does the data say in terms of uh, health span and sleep? It's very I easy for me to dish to the guys who are the experts, Dr. Bruce and Dr. Walker. Um, you know, one's called the sleep doctor. The other one is uh, now he heads up Berkeley. We stole him from the UK and uh, he's written a book. Both Dr. Bruce and Dr. Walker have, have written extensively on sleep, but uh, the science is extremely clear. Seven to nine hours, by the way, mm -hmm. somewhere you fit in there, unless you have, I think it's one of three very rare gene mutations that allows you to get away with like five because you can drop into deep sleep pretty well. But yeah, it's not just about deep sleep. You need your REM and you need your light sleep. And there are further divisions within those. Mm. And how you control those is 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 difficult. Uh, some of it's genetic. Uh, some of it gets into a lot of different nuances. But the basics, you know, as you can break it down in, in terms of like an Ura ring, I think is the best, uh, proven the best in terms of the ability to pick up uh as closely as you could with an EEG, more the gold standard of, you know, determining what levels of sleep you're in. Um, but yeah, if you're not getting seven to nine, and that's going to vary too, by the way, again, like the diet, depending upon what time of year, how hard you're training. So maybe your average is seven and a half, but there may be nights where you go, no, I need eight, even eight and a half. And you may need seven and seven and a half, and you might need the full nine every night, right? So finding that where that is for you and of course where you are in your stage of life, you know, and just because you can doesn't mean you should. I'm so glad you said that. <laughs> I mean, I, I- We all did that, right? Yeah. All of us in here. Probably we, everyone in this room, right? Yeah. We just, Including you, me. You could get away with, right? I remember I, as a young trainer thinking sleep was like, whatever. Then I got older and I worked with these functional medicine practitioners. I'd hear them talk about sleep and I'd see the results on their clients. And at least that my ego wasn't big enough to so big that I didn't, you know, absorb other information. Right. So I remember one of the first clients that I addressed this with and all we did was work on her sleep and she lost seven pounds, but nothing else. She did yeah. nothing else, but fix her. Now, of course that affects everything else, right? Her eating probably changed her activity, but just working on her sleep, seven pounds of body fat was gone. And from then on, I was totally sold. How about muscle? Did she gain some muscle? Oh too? yeah. She gained muscle and strength. I would argue that contributes to it, right? hundred percent, hundred percent. So it's a huge, huge deal. I think we've all experienced that ourselves as dads and you know, you get no sleep with the little ones and they just get older. Well, I think that going back to what we talked about earlier about pe people being aware of their, I think just a lot of people aren't aware of it for some weird reason. There's 
hundreds of books, maybe thousands of books written about morning routines, but very few people focus on evening routines. There's just kind of, we just disregard it. Uh, uh, but yet, ironically, everybody's pretty aware that sleep is important. Like that's been touted for a long time now. Most everybody is familiar with hearing that, yet there's just not a lot of energy and effort put towards how you set that night to be successful. It's just this idea of like, oh yeah, I'm supposed to get seven to nine. And so, okay, I'm going to try and go to bed whenever and fall asleep and only get up at this time. But it's like, man, how you get prepared for bed, I think really makes a a dramatic difference in the quality. They call of, it sleep hygiene now. Yeah. Yeah. So mm-hmm. you t- talk a little bit about that. Like, are, are there things? Yeah, like, should you have an argument with your wife right before going to bed? <laughs> no, are there, are there <laughs> some pretty much always right a it. no yeah. Yeah. <laughs> anytime, anywhere. Right? <laughs> Is there, are there some things that you, either you personally practice or things that you encourage people to do to set them up for success to have that seven to nine hours? Because simply just saying, oh, seven to nine hours, but, you know, if you're one one week, you're getting to bed at nine o'clock, another week, you're getting to bed at 11 p.m. One, one time you're watching tea. Like, what are some good behaviors? That's like? the biggest disaster creator is, you know, the, the shift work, they call it, right? If you are working graveyard, you're still better off than if you're working graveyard and then regular hours and then graveyard and going back and forth, right? We're designed for to be day creatures, so you're messing with some of your uh, neuroendocrine system for sure when you're working graveyard. Melatonin doesn't work uh, uh, during the day. It works when it starts getting dark. And if you're living like a vampire, that's going to hinder you. But again, going back and forth, mixing it up is the worst. And I'm going back to what you referenced about, you know, going to bed at the same time, waking up at the same time. Your body loves that kind of regularity. And if you're going to change one, we've shown, and you're probably <laughs> everyone in this room, for all the years of training, uh, working on a team, whatever, you got up at five every morning. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Try changing that. It's yeah. ridiculous. On yeah. the weekends, you're like, yeah. it's five o'clock. What am I doing here? Yeah. And, and that's actually a good thing. And by the way, on weekends, they say, as much as you don't want to, it, it, you're better off getting up at five o'clock, seven days a week because of that regularity that's needed. But it, it, you know, the hard part is you know, turning off the tube and watching one more of the series right? To, to, to adjust that going to bedtime, which is what you should work on. Um, in terms of um, the, 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 the falling asleep, you're trying to work on something called sleep pressure. For me, and I think everyone in this room, what's the best one for that? Yeah. Working your butt hard yeah. in Exercise. the gym yeah. or wherever you're working out, right? Because that is great. Relieving that pressure is a mistake that some people make by trying to get a nap in. Now, I'm not saying avoid naps. The body's actually designed for this from the research, uh, we're made for that siesta, okay, afternoon. Uh, we don't do that anymore in the industrial ages for the most part. But if you can get away with it, great. If, you, if you're having trouble falling asleep, which is not typically the issue, most people have problems staying asleep. They wake up after four hours thinking about the 2.3 kids and a mortgage, and they ruminate about things. That's much more difficult to deal with. But I argue Again, going back to sleep hygiene, one of the best ways to, to deal with that is to come in to bedtime with as much sleep pressure as possible. So you wake up to go to the bathroom, let's say, you know, four hours in and you're so exhausted, you go back to sleep. There aren't a whole lot of tricks to staying asleep. And one of the things I would say that is a trick you should absolutely avoid at all costs is the use of benzodiazepines, mm. Valiums, Xanaxes and stuff. That can lead to a major disaster real quick. I think it's going to be worse than the opiate scourge. Mm. Yeah, way worse. Interesting. Because uh, it sneaks up on you. The withdrawal symptoms sneak up on you. Whether you're taking it or uh, or you stop taking it, still taking it withdrawal, you can accommodate to these dosage, dosages. Anyway, pills in general are not a good idea. There are no great sleep aids out there where you're not robbing Peter to pay Paul. So- they talk about, you know, not getting in a fight with your spouse, turning off the TV, uh, you know, doing things that chill you out as opposed to checking your email, your business emails right before bed that might wind mm-hmm. you up. Things that make common sense and then just doing the best. Look, having said that, uh, there's a f- famous, um, I guess the equivalent of like a Tony Robbins, uh, Dale Carnegie, you guys remember mm-hmm. that name? Of mm-hmm. course. I think it was he who said, uh, look, if you wake up and you're, you know, tossing and turning for more than a half an hour, there's some people I'm convinced that are just goal oriented. Well, get up out of bed and go do it. What's on your mind, go yeah. work on something <laughs> and then go back to bed. And that sleep pressure will build again. It's not the answer everyone wants to hear, but the body's pretty cool in the way it works in that 
without a pill, if you do that a certain number of nights in a row, typically, not always, but typically, you will go to sleep that one night and then stay asleep and it'll happen for a few nights before it starts mm. happening again. Mm. And I would argue that you guys are probably thinking in your back head, well, that doesn't work for me necessarily. <laughs> there are personality types, and this is just my observation, that you're, you're goal-oriented. The best thing to help you stay asleep at night is accomplishing your goal. Yeah. Mm. And for some of us, that might be the only way you're going to get that sleep. And I have to do that. I wish I had better news. I have to, like, if I have something and it's always business related, right? If I, if Katrina asked me a question or I have, I start thinking about the business at seven, eight, nine o'clock at night, I've got to go write notes down or solve that problem before I go to bed or else it'll disrupt the entire night. That's actually a great idea. And it's, you know, not to play junior shrink here because I'm not a psychiatrist, but that's the one thing I'll, I'll jump in with patients. I'll say, if you do have this issue, write it down at night, whether it's on your iPhone or a pad of paper or whatever, because two things will happen in the light of day. One, well, first of all, if you wake up the next night, you go, shut up, brain. I already wrote that down. Yeah. So I don't need to juggle it in what I call the RAM memory. We do this all the time. Hey, remember to pay the car payment. And then you go through the day and then you wake up and then oh, I forgot to do that. Yeah. Okay. Two, in the light of day, you wake up and you go, make the car payment? Really? That was what I was juggling all day and I woke myself up about? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm going to, it's not going to be a problem. They're not going to come repo the car. <laughs> Typically, I'll get several love letters from the car or the, the bank before they take my, repossess my car. So, you realize, okay, I don't need to do this stuff. And you can put it to bed with something that sounds kind of simple or overly simplified, but sometimes it works. Yeah. Yeah. Now, yeah. yeah. Can you speak a little bit more? And because it's your background is, you know, hormones. I, um, I'm always curious because you've always heard that like getting good sleep and all this, it helps to kind of balance out the hormones and, um, and vice versa or vice versa. So no, if you don't get it, it ruins your hormones sometimes. Yeah. Right. So can you speak a little bit more to like, especially the stress hormones and then how that impacts that. And then also to like, um, you know, how, how you can better improve that whole process and what's happening as you're sleeping with your hormones. A lot of times patients come to my office and ha- make no mention of having trouble sleeping. They've heard that testosterone can get their, uh, their energy back, their libido back, help with body composition. And in the 90 day follow up, they say, and by the way, doc, I'm sleeping so much better. <laughs> And you go, yeah, because to the point we were making earlier, you wake up in the middle of the night. When, when you used to wake up at, when you were 20 years old and think about some of these things, it wasn't the 2.3 kids in a mortgage most likely, but it was something that meant something to you. Nevertheless, back then, it's all relative. What would you do? Shut up, brain. I'll handle it when I wake up in the morning. Now, if you're short in some of these hormones, especially the feel good, the confidence, the whatever you want to call it, you know, the joie de vivre hormone, you wake up almost like, you, you know, when you have the flu and you feel kind of crappy, the world sucks. Well, 14 days later, you feel better. The world hasn't changed, but the world's great again. Yeah. You no, know, it was you. With, with the hormones being off, is my point, particularly testosterone, which again is that feel good and confidence hormone, um, you can have trouble sleeping. And so you fix that and bingo, you know, mm-hmm. everything works again. Now, cortisol levels can rise. You know, and here's one that comes up with people that are into the fasting. You know, if you're not designed for this, some people are. Uh, have you ever tried? It might be a silly All question. Sudden, You've yeah. tried some yeah. some serious fasting, right? I have, yeah. Did you have problems sleeping after a couple couple three nights of fasting? See, so you you must have mm-hmm. a, a pretty good job, a pretty good time of keeping muscle on your frame or regulating your sugars. When I have fasted, which <laughs> I've done probably twice in my life, you know, I don't like missing meals. That's one of the things I noticed after probably the third day. And, and I'm not talking about like a hardcore fast, like a prolonged fast is what I did one time. Uh, I couldn't sleep. My cortisol levels had to have been off the yeah. charts. Huh. And I had, you know, palpitations and arrhythmias and other arrhythmias. Um, so uh, what's my point? You got to you gotta pay attention to what works for you. Again, that theme keeps mm-hmm. popping up. Um, and... Uh, you know, one thing can lead to another, as I said earlier, and vice versa. If you regulate your testosterone, if it's dysregulated, then sometimes that can solve all your sleep problems. And if you're not getting enough sleep and you thereby dysregulate your thyroid, your testosterone, your cortisol, well, then you can have more issues and, and you know, that the snowball effect. And by the way, coming back to just reminding me, um, one of the great motivators for getting enough sleep for probably a lot of all of our patients, clientele, 
five nights in a row of less than your requisite seven to nine hours, whatever it is, you can uh, lower your insulin sensitivity by as much as 50%. Yeah. Wow. And for most people that worry about body composition, that's all they need to hear. Yeah. Although yeah. there's a myriad of reasons why you should get enough sleep, but that will get their attention. Yeah. Right? Make me yeah. feel. <laughs> I think I know why too. Cause like um, in terms of like, I have like, digestive like uh, gastrointestinal issues and so for me to like step away from eating for a bit actually helped in, in enhanced my sleep a bit because of that's like that was usually a thing i had to figure that out to, to stop eating uh at a certain time during the day because that really impacted my yeah. sleep so there was a whole there was a segment in your book that you wrote about um a compound called metformin which i keep hearing about metformin metformin i've always heard this in the biohacking space the health space um, why is this included in your, in your book? And well, first off, what is it and what's the deal with metformin? What does it do? And then why is it in the book, um, uh, you know, that you're talking about with longevity and health span? Now we're getting to some of the nitty gritty beyond the, the basics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there are processes in the body that help reset things. We can call it for lack of a better word, whether it's through a mechanism called autophagy, whether it's through uh, down regulation of, uh, mTOR one complex, um, whether it's through activation of AMPK, these are all uh, avenues by which the body can regenerate itself and uh, recycle things. So metformin is great because first and foremost, it lowers blood sugar. It's an old, very old uh, diabetic drug derived from a, a plant. I didn't know it was old. How long has it been around? <sighs> you know what? I don't know the exact date, but I okay. mean, it's age old and that's oh, why wow. it's cheap as dirt, which oh. is another benefit. Well, okay. that's good because uh, if it's been around for a while, we see we know we have at least some long-term data showing it's- Oh, yeah. the, the safety. I mean, the biggest risk with it, and I've never had an, an issue with any of my patients is if you have- uh, chronic kidney disease, um, you got to work, worry about lactic acidosis, oh, okay. but, uh, okay. 1922, yeah. it was it really? uh, discovered. <laughs> there you go. So, um, metformin has been used by anti-agers more recently to lower blood sugar, which we know comes with all kinds of positives, right? Uh, not overdoing it, which by the way, metformin won't do like if you were to inject yourself with insulin, you can actually kill yourself. Sure. That's why I always caution bodybuilders against, I would never use insulin. It's gotta be the most dangerous hormone energy. they use. Hmm. I, you know what? It, I just, I don't even know how they, well, I know how they rationalize it, but I would never touch it. Okay. Okay. If I were a bodybuilder or anybody, unless you needed it, right? Uh, but metformin is very safe in that regard. The only potential drawback with metformin is there's some evidence that shows it affects uh, one of the mitochondrial, um, well, it affects the mitochondria in, in one of the complexes. I think it's C2. Um, and yet I've talked to athletes to say, no, it hasn't affected my ability to work out at all. And I'm not talking about, you know, your, your weekend athlete. So how much of that is actually real or not, or how much it affects people, I, I, I don't see any evidence for it. But metformin can activate AMPK. Hmm. which they all these the things i mentioned just now seem to be very interrelated i forgot to mention the sirtuin genes we heard about that right activating cert one and cert two uh for these processes that again the the bottom line is they help regenerate the the, the, the tissue they help for example autophagy takes cellular waste and recycles it it cleans up the mess we talked about earlier at a cellular level so i use the 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 analogy of a kitchen right you're slinging food all day and if all you do is keep cooking and slinging food, you're going to have a messy kitchen. You got to stop, wash the dishes, wash the pans. Otherwise, you're cooking tomorrow with a dirty pan and you're going to get something that's not as good for you as it should have been, right? Rancid oil, for example. Well, the same thing happens. You start misfolding the proteins that have one job in mind. Now they're misfolded a little bit and they do something that they're not supposed to do. Or, um, you know, to, to further the analogy, you know, you spilled spaghetti sauce on the on the recipe book. So you go, well, is that three ounces or eight ounces? Can't read that. So the DNA, the recipe gets uh, ruined and then it's making the wrong things because the DNA, the instruction is, is uh, corrupted. So the process of autophagy cleans up the mess. Uh, the process of DNA repair is fixing the recipe book. And all this is happening at a cellular level mm -hmm. and keeping us from degrading. And, and this is a major cause of aging. It's keeping us from aging. Um, how, how much of a difference do you, you see typically in patients when they add metformin to fasting glucose or? Well, it, typically you're going to lower your A1C, which is a measure, hemoglobin A1C. 
by no less than about 0.3% I've observed. And that's mm. just me observing. That's mm -hmm. not a study or whatever. And that's, that's fantastic. I mean, no matter how you're slicing it, that's a great start in the right direction. Right. Um, in terms of feeling better, yeah, most patients who need it are going to notice it. If you're already at a 4.8, which is relatively low, and you go on metformin and drop it to, you know, 4.5, which is pretty much ridiculously low, the juice isn't going to be worth a squeeze. Save your money and do something else. Okay, but, but metformin for somebody who might be in the normal range of, say, 5.5%, and you bring it down to 5.2 or, or 5.0, oh, that's fantastic. What do they notice? Um. You know, most people will say they feel better, but honestly, you may not necessarily notice anything, but you know okay. that you are protected more so in almost all cases against uh, most forms of cancer. Uh, inflammation, remember sugar is, you know, the, the right-hand man of what we now call inflammation. Mm -hmm. Having excess sugar is no bueno. You need enough and no more than that. So regulating sugar in and of itself does does the trick. But again, modulating this this process in the liver called AMPK, uh, you're activating it. Uh, that's a regenerative tool in and of itself. So it's another mechanism, just like exercise is, to say, hey, body, set these wheels in motion. Um, and for some people who, whether they don't like exercise or they can't, okay, uh, can use metformin, not as a replacement, 100%, but to get some of the same benefit without having to do the exercise. Now, if they if they may not uh, feel it, is this a is, is this taking into account when we measure biological age? So let's say they don't feel it, but yet uh, because they start taking this, they could see an improvement on their biological age. Was this is this taking into account when we measure that? Yeah, and of course, when I say you can't feel it, I mean I'm dealing with a patient population that's normally very healthy to begin with. If you're diabetic and you get on metformin, you're probably going to notice a yeah. big difference. Yeah, yeah. No, but I like you saying that. I appreciate it because a lot of times people just disregard something because they don't have this feeling, you know, which is why I think things like pre-workout are so oversold because it's something that people feel. And so they just assume it's this yeah. great thing. It's just like, a listen, full of nice and you'll yeah, feel this. <laughs> yeah. They'll take a, they'll pick a pre-workout, but then they're, they're low on vitamin D. They don't get enough magnesium. They're missing all these things that are way more essential, but they're pumping the pre-workout because they can feel it. When I take vitamin D, I don't really feel anything. When I take magnesium, I don't really feel anything. So they don't take those things. And it's just like, you're missing that. So I, that's why I like that you say, that you may not feel it, but hey, if it's improving your your biological age, it's it's improving. And that's you know? part of the, the reason behind the book is to show, hey, look, if you don't see a benefit like you're describing without looking at, say, the assays of your blood, biological markers for aging, infl inflammatory markers, here's the science behind it. So even if you don't feel like, you know, obviously testosterone, if you're low on it, if you replace it, that's a sexy hormone, literally and figuratively in a lot of ways, right? right? You feel the difference with that. But if you were to pump up your pregnant alone, are you going to appreciate a difference in color perception necessarily? No. <laughs> are you going to notice uh, your, your cognition bouncing up? Not necessarily. I, I would argue not even close to just having the energy for the brain to work that you're going to get with the, the restoration of your testosterone level. So you do have to rely on the science and go, okay, but here's what the studies show and trust that, yeah, this is helping me in the long haul over the next 20 years or literally the rest of my life, which right. we hope is going to be a lot longer than that. And that's important, right? I think you guys probably experience the same frustration I do because of just what you're saying. Oh, I don't say, notice anything with that extra magnesium, except, you know, I have an explosive stool the next morning. Okay, well, <laughs> first of all, let's modulate the dose. But second of all, it's a long-term play here, guys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Let's talk about hormone therapy. This is obviously your the field that you're, you're, you're <clears throat> most active in. Um, and uh, hormone therapy has been relegated for a long time, I guess, if you consider what the public perception to be, to be kind of like this cosmetic part of health. Like, oh, hormone therapy, just to make you look better, make your skin look better. This is what Hollywood actors do. This is what celebrities do. But you put it in your book uh, in regards to health span and longevity. So let's talk about that with hormone therapy. How can hormone therapy improve those in people? Well, if we skip the, uh, I don't know if you want to refer to it as the hedonistic aspects of it, which, hey, what's wrong with that? Who doesn't want to look better, feel better, sure. uh, perform better? But, um, and I think I make it in reference to, you know, controversial topic uh, that includes anabolic steroids, right? 
I believe it's the fourth leading cause of death currently uh, uh, falls, right? In the elderly, people mm. that are infirm oh, for, for oh, whatever yeah. reason, right? It's a misleading stat because while they may not die from the fall itself, oftentimes they'll die because of, say, a hospital-acquired pneumonia yep. or because they decompensate so much that, you know, within a six-month or 12-month period, they die because they just they decompensate. Dr. Rand, let me stop you right there. Yeah, yeah. I, I train a lot of surgeons, and I'll never forget this, that I heard from at least four of them the following statement. They would say, yeah, you, you break a hip and then you die of pneumonia. Mm -hmm. They would say that all the time. So you, you could see the direct deaths from falls, but they would tell me all the time, oh, when you're at that age and you don't have good mobility and strength to begin with, and then you break a bone, your lifespan is dramatically shortened because of all the potential stuff that happens. Absolutely. Yeah. And you know how I think it's still the same way, but uh, after they surgically correct that broken hip, I think it's three days. If you don't die within those three days, then it doesn't count as you died of that broken hip. Yeah. Oh, right. interesting. Think about that for a second, if it's still the way they they, they keep tallies. Hmm. So yeah, you might argue it's closer to, you know, number two or a close, you know, third leading cause of death. Well, it makes no, well, let's put it positively. It makes sense then that you want to make those infirm people firm enough, as it were, <sighs> so they don't fall as easily. You know, you still have to get there and out there and do the work, but why don't a lot of uh, patients, clients do the work. They're not seeing results. And if you're 80 years old and you pick up a, a, a weight program, you're less likely to see results than some of our 30 year olds are already complaining that they're not seeing the results enough. <laughs> well, you give them the ability to leverage all the good work they're doing, which goes into more than just the exercise, the sleep and the eating right and everything. And they get the results and they're less likely to fall. I mean, to me, it's an out of the park home run. Do you guys agree? Oh, oh, yeah, oh 100, 100, 100 percent. You're, you're preaching the choir. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, you know, you know, optimizing hormones, uh, you know, through working with a doctor in combination with all those other things we talked about, it's like night and day in terms of the types of results and, and progress and strength that someone's going to get. Is that a fair statement? Yeah. And, and the, you know, the, the horse is out of the barn in this one. There's so much research out there. It, it, it boggles my mind. I hate to say it, but almost on a daily basis, when I hear patients referring to other physicians, and I don't, you know, I can say this because I'm a fellow physician, right? Mm -hmm. So I can bag on my own profession to some degree, <laughs> uh, that haven't done the research on this because even if it's the first time a patient is mentioning it, well, don't just poo-poo it out of hand. Go back and do the research because it's out there. There's plenty out there. Start with the publication in the Mayo Clinical Proceedings in 2016 from the uh, the international consensus from 2015 that was headed by uh, Abraham Morgan Tyler. Um, you know, he's with Harvard and uh, he wrote Testosterone for Life. But he got together over 20 of the leading uh, urologists, I think all of them, in the world and came up with nine resolutions. Just start there. I'll, I'll leave it at that so audience can go out there and look it up themselves. But just with that, you go, oh, coronary artery disease, that's out. It actually is correlated, meaning low testosterone with coronary artery disease, not the other way around. Right. Type 2 diabetes, out. Cancer, out. These rumors are very easily dispelled. And, and so physicians nowadays have no excuse. And, and I think that's that's turning around so that more and more people are, are going to get access to what should be basic. Right? I feel it's one of those, you know, the, the dose determines the poison type of deal where, you know, Always. the, the, the few anomalies that have been highlighted in the news or whatever that of, Oh, so-and-so. And then they try and pin it to, he was taking all these anabolic steroids. Therefore they're bad. Like they try and correlate things like that, that happen all the time. And that's it's like huge. I can't name names, but, you know, I'm in Los Angeles. I work out at the Mecca and, you know, in Venice. And so I see and know a lot of these stories and what they don't include because it takes away from the sensationalization of the story is that, first of all, unfortunately, and I'm not saying this is the case for all bodybuilders, certainly or anything, but look, if all, I say all, I don't mean to sound that way either, because a lot of these guys hold regular jobs and still do it. Mm -hmm. But certainly in the old days, the job was just being a bodybuilder, right? And so you worked out and then you ate and then you hung out and let's just say idle mind is the devil's playground. So a lot of these guys, point is, were taking recreational drugs that led to their death. A lot of these guys also had things that you don't hear about where for a lot of reasons, they're scared to go to the doctor because they don't want to get a lecture about all the stuff they're taking, um, or they're just scared of uh, physicians, or they're just scared 
uh, uh, overall about, oh, I have this chest pain now for three years yeah. that I haven't seen the doctor about. And that can happen to anybody. Yeah. It's magnified, it's leveraged, however, by anabolic steroids, which are different than testosterone, regular endogenously produced steroids, right? In that it, it furthers the production of cholesterol, particularly the so-called bad cholesterol, the LDL, that if you have extant coronary artery disease, is only going to make it a heck of a lot worse. So was it the anabolic steroids or was it the person? Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah you know, it's funny. I just looked this up uh, the other day in, in preparation for this. Uh, it just, I went down a rabbit hole and I looked at the pro bodybuilders, which is an extreme, by the way, um, just for the audience, all extreme sports, you're going to see a, there's always a, there, there's a trade-off at that level with uh, longevity and performance at the extreme levels. Great okay? point. True. So if you look at like the top, top, top endurance athletes, you'll see them. They don't have, they don't live very long in comparison to healthy, uh, normal people. Especially if they try and stay in it for too long. And we go back to that whole idea of yes. the J curve or hormesis yeah. too much. Yeah. So you see this with pro athletes. You see, and so pro bodybuilders are the extreme end of strength training or, you know, lifting weights. But what's interesting is you do see a higher rate among them with coronary artery type diseases and heart issues. They have a much lower than average rate of cancer, which is cool because this peaks into the potential value of just simply building muscle. And studies will show muscle is actually, or building muscle is a wonderful protection against cancer. So I'm not saying go be a pro bodybuilder because you do raise your risk of, you know, if you live like them of, of dying of heart issues. But even at that extreme level, their muscle, even with their crazy lifestyle, they have uh, half the rate of cancers than the average person, which is, I think, kind of interesting. That's huge. Yeah. And again, you don't have to be, you know, you don't have to. Matter of fact, you are not as healthy to pack on excess muscle. Right. Muscle that I would argue is non-functional because as a bodybuilder, you're not you're building forcing, the sarcomeres yeah. perpendicular to to uh, resistance, right? You don't, you, you don't care if they go this way, this way. That you're just trying to build mass. And that extra is actually a liability as opposed to functional muscle. And I was making this point recently, too. <laughs> So yeah, you're, you're, you're spot on as usual, I mean, it, it, you know, again, the doses and the poison, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, one, one point I want to uh, make about that too, is that um, with heart, okay. Atrial fibrillation, very common, much more so than certainly you would expect, right? I'm, I'm, I'm running every day or I'm rowing every day, biking every day. Athletes like that have a greater instance than the norm of atrial fibrillation, which is an irregular heartbeat, mm -hmm. very common. However, and first of all, let's absorb that for a second. That's a jip, right? Wait, I'm supposed to yeah, I'm doing exactly. stuff that's supposed to be good for me. Complications from it, though, are way, way uh, lower, fewer than the normal average person. So, okay, you get this, and it has to do with just thing, you know, you get a larger heart, it's closer to the pulmonary uh, There vein. could be an adaptation there. We're just not quite, we don't really know all yeah, about Yeah, it's kind of like, it's a gyp. It's like, well, you know, the, the, the formation of plaques is an adaptation that 30 or 300 years ago was great. Yeah, patch off the artery because you were dead by 30, 35 on average. <laughs> yeah. So it didn't matter if you patched it too much, yeah. right? But now we're living long, longer. It's an adaptation that didn't serve us well. Yeah. So uh, in this case, you know, I still are you keep going with your endurance training because at the end of the day, even though you, you're, you're more likely to develop AFib than the average person, you are still yeah. better off from it. You're not going to become what they say, hemodynamically unstable because of it, which is a fancy way of saying you have problems because of it. You know. Yeah. Now, I, now, I know that um, hormone therapy can be appropriate for almost anybody, depending on the situation. I mean, you could have children who are growth hormone deficient or have issues with their hormones. But generally speaking with healthy people, when does hormone therapy become something that's like, okay, it's probably this is around the age where you should look into this because you're gonna, you're probably going to start to really derive some value from moving in this direction. Great question. And one that gets not enough attention. Uh, although Abraham Morgan Taylor, who used to frustrate me because he would use a number and he was considered one of the leading experts along with doc, guys like Dr. Lipschultz, okay. uh, pioneers like Lee and Wright, um, but, you know, it used to be for men, it used to be a total testosterone of 450 or below, 450 nanograms per deciliter. Now, That's to answer average. your question, yeah. it is not a number. It's when you start having symptoms. Duh. Mm. Right? Everyone's different. And what are you going to do? If someone comes up and forget about, you know, laboratory assays being not necessarily precise all the time and therefore accurate all the time. But if you came up for the old standard at... 451, does that mean you're not going to treat, 
<laughs> you know, and, and no, it gets crazy in a lot of this with medicine, like, you know, the new weight loss drugs. Do you stop giving the new weight loss drugs when they're no longer at a BMI that suggests right. they're overweight? And then we're going to go like this the rest of their life? Or do you say, okay, this person has an issue, let's continue. So anyway, the, to answer your question with, again, a long-winded answer, when someone comes up with what our standard or not, but, you know, what, which impl implicates low testosterone, well, that's when you start to look into it anyway. Now, of course, you look up and you go, wow, you've got a thousand nanograms per deciliter of total testosterone. We should probably look somewhere else for the reasons why you have low energy and, mm -hmm. and you know, erectile dysfunction or something like that. But if it, if it comes to instead of 450, you know, 550, you go, yeah, let's give this a whirl or when at does, least retest. When does that commonly start to pop up in most people like in their 40s, would you say? I think by definition, it's still age 35, whether it's for perimenopause or paraandropause, we call Got it, it, or menopause. I, Got guess it. I don't know. That was a thing. By the way, yeah. By, by the way, just to back you up, there was a study done um, on testosterone and uh, the ability to build muscle and strength. And they were trying to see if there was a relationship between total testosterone, free testosterone, and muscle and strength. And what they found that was a better indicator or correlate for strength and muscle was androgen receptor density. So back to what you were saying, someone could have, you know, testosterone up here, someone could have it kind of below, but the guy with the lower testosterone has more androgen receptors, feels great. The guy over here has got low density of androgen receptors, doesn't feel so great. So this is why those ranges are can be so so wildly different. And that does happen. And it's one of the cool things about mother nature too, is that's going to vary not just by genetics, but, you know, uh, well, to some degree, your ability to adapt is obviously based upon your genetics too. But I always explain to patients, what's cool is if your body can't make more keys, more testosterone for the locks, it'll make more locks for the same keys. Uh -huh. That's upregulating the, the receptors, the, the density, as you put of the androgen receptors. How cool is that? Yeah. And then, you know, that's why when people first start on TRT, oftentimes I get the, wow, you know, if I could just feel the same way I did after the first six weeks, you're getting started, you know, when it kicked oh, in the first, first six weeks. Yeah. Because after that six weeks and it kicks in, you've got a month where you your body's still got those androgen receptors upregulated and you feel better than you might ever feel. Um, and then they downregulate to what is more normal, yeah. right? Is that why for the first uh, three months, my libido was... I, I, Most likely yeah, so, yeah. I was driving yeah. my wife crazy. It was too much. <laughs> <laughs> and then it regulated out. You know, what do you think? So uh, my mother-in-law does this, and uh, I wish I had met her when I was a young trainer, and I thought I thought that was very interesting and uh, smart that she would told her kids to do this. When they were in their late 20s and, thir and by, by 30, it was like her thing, like, make sure you go get your blood work done by 30. And she would tell them to get all your hormones checked the, and, and when you're in a state of feeling good. Because I know there's people listening right now that are like, oh, I feel good. I don't need any hormones or I'm young, right? And she would say, what you should do is get it checked then so you know your baseline. So then when you do hit... 35, 40, or 50 years old, and you don't feel good, you, some reference you have a reference point to yeah. go like, and to add to your point of like how, you know, you could be a 450 person and feel amazing on 450, or you could be a 900 person and feel amazing or terrible and vice versa. It's absolutely true. And most of the people who come see me in my practice are in need of testosterone replacement therapy. But I get people that say, hey, I'm just here to be proactive. I want to know and uh, gosh, I've had two in the last uh, two weeks whose levels weren't necessarily great, but said, yeah, I don't have any complaints. I said, well, great. Yeah. Then we don't have to talk about testosterone. Some other things you can do to be proactive. And we had a discussion about sleep and, 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 and a lot of other things. But that is, again, the key, you know, per your question. Do you have the symptoms or not? You don't treat what doesn't exist, right? right. So, and, and, you know, you don't fix what's not broken, now, the other, the other part to that, though, is, again, we do have, and you got to be careful here, correlation yeah. between low testosterone, things like coronary artery disease, type 2 diabetes, colon cancer, prostate cancer, and osteoporosis. But anyone in this room, if you were not on T, I would say, so what are the odds that you're going to get any of those, right? Um, with the exception of prostate cancer and coronary artery disease, which can be driven by genetics and, and some other factors, and we can screen for those. And again, if you say, yeah, I'm good, then I wouldn't necessarily do it because it's correlated with things that are associated with dysfunction and aging. You with me? Uh, yeah. Absolutely. So, All right, let's talk about peptides. The peptide space is fascinating to me. This is like a whole, it's, it's exploding, by the way. Obviously, in our space, people are talking about peptides left and right. Um, what peptides would you say are, are in the in the context of um, you know longevity and, and health span? Would you say, you know, and I know it's up to the individual, right? Some are going to be better for some people than others. 
But which ones do you like to work with the most uh, in that in that category for improving those things? The most popular uh, are the growth hormone releasing secretagogues that are peptides. Although I have to throw in there one that's not a peptide. It's a peptide mimetic, which is just a fancy way of saying it looks and acts like one, but it's not. Uh, it's ibutamorin. Right. Uh, but they help uh, the body's own ability to produce more growth hormone. And of course, then eventually uh, some IGF-1, which does most of the yeoman's work, but doesn't get the credit for what GH does, which only lasts for about 30 minutes anyway in the body. Uh, that's probably the most popular because it helps regenerate tissue, organs, particularly ligaments and tendons uh, for the athlete. And um, I'd say, again, that's the most popular. It, it's, it's not well known, but you know we cannot, as doctors, prescribe growth hormone except for seven what are considered wasting disorders, it's actually illegal. It, uh, no, it's growth just, hormone is it's crazy only, because it's like the fountain of youth. That's, you know? that's crazy. Well, it's been touted as a fountain of youth. I would say not necessarily. And there's arguments, of course, about IGF-1 being higher or low, and we can get to that if you want, because I definitely have my own opinion about it, seeing patients over the years. But um, it, it's the only FDA-approved approved drug that's not approved for off-label use. I would argue, though, that... Uh, you don't need it. First of all, it's ridiculously expensive. Mm. And the levels that you're looking for, you want to approximate, and we use IGF-1 as a circuit marker for GH, are the levels you had, say, when you were 20, if you're using it to to, to help regenerate organs. And I said I wasn't going to go off on this, but just very briefly as a side tangent, if you're riding a desk all day, do you really need a lot of growth hormone slash IGF-1? Probably not as much as if you're working an oil rig. Got it. Okay, or you're working like you guys are every day, you know, with patients and and uh, working out hard. yourselves and that sort of thing. Um, but to get the level you had when you were 20, which would amount to, uh, say, um, say 350, I think it's milligrams per deciliter of IGF-1, you only need a, 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 a GH secretagogue because you'll get there with it. Mm. And then you're, 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 you're called, you're recrudescing the gland. You're getting it running like it used to when you were 20 and you're not suppressing its own use. So let's say you go to Las Vegas, you don't want to bring your injectable CJC 1295, which is a peptide that'll uh, boost your growth hormone levels. Well, you're not going to be tanked all of a sudden. You'll just slowly come back down to your prior mm -hmm. level of natural production, right? And again, if you can keep it going, which we can't do with testosterone uh, at later ages, that's why we use TRT, then why not keep it going with something that gets your own GH uh, producing itself? How, how effective are they at raising, because you guys will measure IGF-1, that's kind of the surrogate, right? So you'll, yeah. they'll, they'll, you'll put them on a, a secretagogue, ipamerolin or you know CJC or you know, ibutamorin, and you'll look at the I, IGF-1 and how effective is it? Per, with each patient when you have them take it? Do you always see or do you sometimes see not Unfortunately, so much? Unfortunately, not always, no. Okay. And, and it's funny to see how people will or will not react to certain ones. There's an issue involved where you don't want to be suppressing your own production by eating late at night and therefore spiking your own insulin production, mm -hmm. which will counter the effects. You know, they oppose the effects of endogenous production of GH. Uh, so that's one thing you got to avoid, and that can confound the results. You know, if a patient's not compliant with that, or they're sensitive to it, or they're insulin insensitive, and their insulin's mm -hmm. always kind of high anyway. Uh, but yeah, for the most part, though, I will say, not just in studies I've read in the last six months, but over the course of my use of yeah. ibutamorin for at least a decade, definitely see the best results with ibutamorin. What oh, is it? What is it about ibutamorin that makes me sleep like a baby? I mean, I get some of the most amazing sleep. I wish I knew because you're not necessarily the rule. Some people actually really? will wake up hungry. It's not the the norm. But it's the flip side where the ghrelin that's activated, it's through the whole mechanism is through ghrelin, which is the same mechanism that you get the munchies from if you yeah. smoke dope. It's a ghrelin agonist? Is that what it is? It's a ghrelin agonist, okay. yes. Yeah, so that can make you hungry. That's why you should take these at, at bedtime. Yeah. Don't go channel surfing or you'll wake up and it'll look like a bomb went off in your kitchen. <laughs> but some people get the somnolence <laughs> from ibutamorin. Most people get some form of somnolence, somnolence if they're going to get any from Samorlin, one of the original ones that used to be called Jeref. Dr. Walker was involved in all that research. What's what's the half-life for uh, ibutamorin? Is 24 hours? Oh boy. He put me on the spot. I'm sorry. I think it might be about 24. Like, that's why you take it daily, if I'm not mistaken. Oh yeah, you definitely want to take it nightly, and, okay. and uh, yeah, I mean like some Orland, I think it's like max fifteen minutes is the half life. Yeah. So I so I tried I tried the CJC twelve nine five with the Samarolin combination, then I then I did the Ibutamorin, very different 
uh, results from each one of them. The ibutamorin, like, uh, man, first of all, my appetite goes up all day long. So I would say when I've talked about it, um, yeah, it's just 24 hours. When I, when I talk about it to our audience, I say, if you're trying to gain muscle and you need to feed yourself, for me at least, this is great because it makes me want to eat. Um, and I get strength gains. I get crazy pumps in the gym. I feel like I'm on something. The other combination is much more subtle. Um, I just kind of feel better. But it doesn't, it's not like a, like the Ibutamorin is like, holy crap, I'm on something. Like You're probably experiencing a little bit of water retention too, which yes. is about 20, 25 That's where the pumps the come users. from. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And you feel like the joints are hydraulic now. <laughs> yeah. right? Probably literally in some cases, right? Yeah. With the Ibutamorin. Yeah. yeah. I, I love the sleep from it. I mean, I noticed, it, I noticed a huge difference of just like crash. Then there you go. I mean, uh, and that, those are the things that come up. Um, and if we start having issues with people staying asleep, like we talked about earlier, those are things that uh, as a physician and hopefully just because it's out there now, you got to think about yeah. and, and maybe bring it up with your own physician. Like, you know, I don't want to do Ambien, which by the way, I didn't say this earlier, but most of the sleep aids are to get you to fall asleep, not stay asleep. Yeah. So Ambien, Lunesta, what we call the Z drugs, because mm -hmm. they have a Z in them, including yeah. the benzodiazepines. Uh, are for falling asleep. Although, as I say that, the benzos are actually to help you stay asleep, but I don't recommend you use them. But uh, again, something like this, it's a win-win. Well, so I have this, <coughs> I, I swear I have like, a, it runs in my family, my uncle, my my whatever, everybody in it, we've all been this way. I've been this way since I was a child. It's like, I'm so sensitive to having to go pee that even if I don't have to go pee bad, just a little bit, I wake up. And the only thing that's made me sleep through that is the I can. It'll make me sleep. It makes through. you sleep heavier. Yeah. yeah. I sleep heavier through the night and I'm, <laughs> I'm totally fine. If not, I'm like so sensitive that I'll wake up two or three times, have to go yeah, pee. But who isn't, man? Who can wake up and go, oh, I have to pee and then go back to sleep? Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. So I, the idea, like I think you're suggesting, is you don't want to you want to not wake up for any reason, That's right? Until it's time to wake up. Yeah, officially no, hundred percent. I, 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 as I got old, as I've gotten older over the last maybe ten years, I have to wake up to go pee in, you know, at once. But uh, I stopped drinking water like two hours before. Make sure I get all my water, but then stop about it two hours before. That made a big difference uh, for me. Yeah, so. that'll that'll take me from like three down to two, right? Wow. So that's like, that's kind of what happens when, when but I, the ibutamorin has been one of the few things that I've been able to take that actually will get me through the night sometimes, which is amazing. So. I would stay with it then. Yeah. No, because of the reason of uh, how important sleep is, un uninterrupted sleep. Yep, yeah. no. Um, there was a segment in your book about um, some like kind of stuff that's happening on the, like, I don't know if it's uh you know, in the future, like gene editing and like kind of looking forward stem cell type of stuff. Like wh wh where does that fall in this category of- This is where it gets really exciting okay. because now we're talking about really doing some sharpshooting that can make a big difference in life. With gene editing, I'll start there, you know, where it's actually pretty easy to do compared to a lot of things that we can do, but we don't have enough testing yet. And it's politically charged too, because you're you're really changing the cards you were dealt with. So there's a lot of oh, okay, well, you know, we're manipulating uh, what God did and mm -hmm. that sort of thing out there. Um, we're testing a lot of, in my opinion, we're testing a lot of the rare disorders first. I think consciously we're doing this on purpose, um, and we're getting a lot of good results. We've had some failures. And I'm not sure it's for the gene editing per se, if this makes sense, but perhaps the way we're trying, what, what we're splicing in there, we, we I don't think we have it necessarily right. So so we've had some deaths, but you know, when you're dealing with rare disorders or really serious ones, it makes the stakes a little bit lower in the sense that, hey, well, I was going to live with, say, Huntington's Korea, which mm. is miserable. God forbid, you know, anyone has it because in your 30s, uh, it's just, I, you know, it's, it's a horrible disease to get anyone would take the chance to get rid of that yeah. disease if they knew it was coming. Right. Um, so I think we're, 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 do you think in the next decade or two that this, this is going to just revolutionize? Yeah, we have to. Okay. Okay. Cause here now with, with gene editing, you're changing the, the, the genome. Okay. Mm -hmm. Your genome sequencing, not the epigenome, which would then of course be the effect you're having on the DNA. This goes back to something that, you know, changes the entire window with which you have to work. So some people have a window that they're more predisposed to diabetes. And if they eat a ketogenic diet, for example, and fast and do a lot of uh, exercise, will never face anything close to diabetes. But if they don't, boy, are they likely to mm -hmm. get it. This makes it so, you know, it shifts over like this so that, yeah, the odds of you getting diabetes, I mean, you just have to really screw up. Okay. 
You follow? And, yeah. and of course, with major diseases, I mean, that's a game changer. Forget about some of these things that we can already control with what we call our activities of daily living that just turns off that gene, which is somewhat minor, okay, which puts you over here. Like I say, with the ketogenic diet, doesn't activate those genes. So yeah, that, that one's that one's a game changer. And and I, you know, if you if you take it to its ultimate, then we change our genes that allow us to um like lizards, you know, regrow a tail. We can regrow organs, you know, conceivably down the road. We can um uh extend our predetermined lifespan. And, and then you combine that with um, you know, talking about regrowing tails and whatnot, with stem cells, okay and gene editing, or just with stem cells alone, conceivably, we can generate new organs that can then be transplanted. So, you know, uh, and you, you had a take, heart attack for whatever reason or some toxic event or virus and yeah, your heart You don't need to shot. take immune suppressing drug. It's like your own organ. It just goes right in. Your body accepts it. That's the ideal, right? Yeah. Excellent. Ha have, we, have we been measuring people's biological age long enough to see some interesting like what are the most like dramatic swings you've seen like someone comes in the first time you do biological age it says you know and their uh their chronological age is actually 50 and it says they're 70 or whatever you start to dial some things in get them on hormone and they're doing all these great and then all of a sudden it goes from 70 all the way down to say 50 like what are some how are we i yeah, not to be how much are we moving the needle? I guess. Yeah, I mean, it, it's hard to answer because of the testing. How confident are we with the testing? Like, if you look at my first generation of the biological aging clock, you might see a difference of twenty years, and you go, "Okay, that might represent five, you know, mm. ideally, you yeah. know, maximally." But it means we're in the right direction. It goes back to that precision and accuracy got it, got thing. It. But uh, again, it has to do with the faith that you have or don't have in the markers we're using. Ah, I, I don't think we can we can quantify it as much as we want to right now. I think most of what we go back to is what any layman can do for the most part and look at somebody and go, ooh, you say you're 50, huh? You look like you're 70. <laughs> you know, or God, dog, you're 70? No yeah. way, dude. Yeah. That That's your best gauge. And this is where we'll go back to the gene editing, though, I think, because we're finding there are definitely some advantages that centenarians have, mm. uh, genetically speaking. And to delve into that just a smidge, What's happening is there, and I think we're going to focus a lot more on, on immune system and, and changing the immune function through gene editing. They're getting the same disease as we are. They're just postponing it a decade or more. Mm. And then they come up with Alzheimer's, heart disease or whatever, but it's not until they're 100 mm. or 90 or whatever. So that's the key right now. But with gene editing, I think we can change that certainly, but I think we'll also extend, you know, the estimates are right now we can make it to 120 based upon the limits of our genes, but we'll be able to extend that as we, you know, learn more and more about what we can do with the genes and which ones do which. Wow. What, mm. what about current like available stem cell therapies? Like I had a friend who's like, oh man, you, there, I went to this doctor in Mexico and they did the mm -hmm. stem cell, you know, <laughs> therapy. My knee pain was totally gone or, and I hear stories like this. I don't know much about it. Um, and just to, you know, as someone who's always skeptical, I'm always like, well, Okay, but like what's going on there? Yeah, the body was going to do that anyway. Yeah, it, it, yeah. is like what what have you seen with stem cell therapy now? Like like let's talk about not maybe not the future, but what 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 does it do now? What do we know that it can do now for people? You're picking one of my favorites because I've experienced the results of that myself wow. as I document in the book. Yeah. Um the stem cell knows what to do and now we've identified another cell called a mu cell which is even arguably more effective and with no risk of cancer development, which is a minor risk with stem cells anyway, but I have to say that because it is a difference. The stem cell can, I mean, I argue a monkey could do it because the stem cell knows where to go to get the work done. It knows where to find the work. And then once it gets there, knows what to do. So mm. uh, you can inject it intravenously. A, a very large percentage goes, you know, through the lungs, but uh, or and may stay there, but the rest of it goes to the rest of the body and will find, say, damaged heart tissue. And if it's your own stem cell uh, derived from your own bone marrow or, you know, collected through apheresis or whatever it might be, your stem cells will find that and, and actually engraft and replace that damaged heart wow. tissue cell, a myocyte we would call it, right? So to me, that's just fascinating. And, that's, and that we can do right now. 
where we have more room to improve is with nerve tissue repair, mm. because that's the one where, like, for example, we've had, um, and you can imagine where this would be really good oh, yeah. uh, to, to with, with uh, spinal cord injuries, yeah. right? Uh, unfortunately, uh, a goodly amount, I think is 25% of the time. Uh, and it's mainly because we haven't, what we call pre-differentiated. We haven't started the stem cell in the right direction toward uh, a nerve tissue, 25% of the time you'll start to develop a, a tumor. That's no bueno, mm. all right? Uh, so, so we're advancing there, but here's another area where that we can do work with right now that I think is exciting, uh, where we use stem cells to create organ tissue. So we can uh, start with uh, you know harvested tissue from a liver and use that to create a bunch of Petri dishes, as it were, with liver tissue and test various therapies, whether it's drug therapy or not. So we don't have to go through human trials right it's away or even on. animal trials. We're skipping to human tissue right away. And think about it. We replicate human livers and we say, okay, this drug works to get rid of fatty liver or oh, not. Oh, I see. Wow. The development yeah. process. Fascinating. Is it, it, and you combine that with, with AI. To skip ahead with AI. Which you I combine it with AI, it. that's going to be like wow. speed everything up. Yeah. This wow. is where I'm getting really excited where, and, and you know, to borrow from Ray Kurzweil, live long enough to live forever or live long enough to live longer, right? Yeah. Stick with the basics, stay in the game while we develop these over the next decade or so, so we can take advantage of them and then extend our health and longevity even further. Well, wow. yeah, a, a lot Perfect. of the the advancements in, um, for example, cancer treatments or other types of treatments where we see people are living longer or surviving has to do with early detection and technologies that are able to detect things, but when they're treatable, you have a segment in the book talking about this. Are there advancements or new ways that you could detect? You know, like maybe like, like I heard about people getting these like full body scans uh, where they're going, oh, you know, looks like we're early. We have a super early case of this type of cancer. You wouldn't have seen this unless it got to stage four. Now we could treat it and you're fine type of deal. Or are there new technologies with early detection now that people can look into? Yeah, and that's huge because I would argue there's very little, if any, excuse to die from breast cancer, prostate cancer heart disease uh, or colon cancer now, if you make use of the early detection tools we have. Um, imaging, like you suggest, MRI imaging is, is very useful because you can see a tumor. Um, for example, for prostate, there's nothing better than uh, something called a multi-parametric MRI of the prostate, mm. where we can see a lesion in something that's typically walnut sized or larger as small as three millimeters. Oh, wow. And I think the cure rate for cancer uh, stage, I want to say two or below, I might be wrong on that, is like 97%, mm. okay, with what we call a pyrads two or lower. It's just a staging. That's for prostate It's cancer. not the standard staging, but it's something you pick up per imaging. That's where, they'll, that's where you have that early detection of prostate cancer? That's before you've biopsied it, yeah. Wow. And then will, is that what, will it put like radioactive pellets or whatever there? And just, well, that's one option okay. of treatment, but the idea is you have, well, you've identified it. So now you know what your options are, That's it. right? The first mm -hmm. thing is to identify it. Um, you know, I went through it. I, I document that in the book. Uh, maybe I don't document it to a large degree, but uh, you know, I, I caught it at what we would call stage zero. And I think I'm six years now, cancer free wow. without a biopsy. Uh, we found it with imaging and, and, and to, to go further than what you were saying with a liquid biopsy test. Back then it was called Oncoblot, but it's similar to a lot of these new ones. The most famous is the Galeri, uh, from mm. Grail, uh, which can detect, I think, over 50 different cancers. Uh, prostate's not one of their biggest ones. I think they have like a 37% uh, sensitivity. Um, but uh, these are all tools that should be utilized together. Okay. And, 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 you know, in medicine, we don't like to shotgun things necessarily. And you don't want to open up a Pandora's box. You know, I was always taught you do tests based upon you know, what you pick up in mm. history and physical and complaints and stuff, you don't just treat it like a car and have a typical maintenance, you know, plan that you, okay, let's test all these things and tweak that and tweak that mm -hmm. based on, on the testing. But here, I think it's definitely different where you want to use every screening tool possible because uh, you do want to open up that can if it's appropriate. Okay. So if you can detect that prostate uh, cancer, and I'm harping on that one, because think about it. 
we're all athletes here, right? How many times do you have to take a swing at a baseball before you're good at it? They, right. they, they, they yeah. say 10,000 swings. Yep. Do you think that proctologist has done this 10,000 times <laughs> yeah. and with proficiency? Yeah. The tip of the finger against something kind of mushy the size of a, of a, a, of a walnut? Come on, guys. I mean, yeah. really. Yeah. What, made, can, what made you get that the imaging? Was it did you get a PSA test that came back? Or well, this oncoblot, like, this liquid, liquid biopsy, which is no longer available in the United States, picked up on uh, something called an Enox two protein, which is only um, it's only found in fetal tissue or cancer. Wow. Period. So you weren't pregnant. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, I mean that's developing too because uh, Dr. Moray, who spent at least thirty five years, thirty four years of his life. Uh, researching this. He wrote a big textbook on it. I'm not going to say that it was an error, but uh, it may not actually be, it's associated, but it may not, may not be the actual Enox2 protein. But the point being uh, very accurate. Everybody I ever used the test on, we, except for one instance, we, we had a GI cancer that we couldn't find. Now, you know, you know how long the GI tract is and how hard it might be to find that on imaging yeah. or any other kind of testing. Uh, but in the studies with Moray, um, if they couldn't find the cancer initially that was picked up with the Enox2 protein test, which will pick up the, the test and based upon the, um, the weight, okay, and the, the pH, we, we can find the, the origin, the, the tissue of origin. Um, we later found the cancer. Mm. Okay, so there's a 100% correlation with the early tests and, you know, a significant number of people uh, where it's not like, okay, this is not uh, a, a powerful enough study, but uh, we have other ones now. I mean, you know, there's ways to pick up on certain forms of prostate cancer, PCA3, again, the liquid biopsy, and there are so many coming down. There's a, uh, I want to say C2N is the company that has a test for uh, Alzheimer's now. Oh, wow. Yeah. And it's early, early detection. Yeah. Wow. Mm. Yeah, I've read that that the that you that Alzheimer's starts decades before somebody has like really signs of it. Yeah, yeah. which you want to jump on if you can. If there's anything you can do about that one, I mean, you know, I feel for it's in my family, so uh, not by gene but by expression, and so it, it's a sensitive topic for me too. But yeah, I mean, who wants to go that way if you can avoid it? And that's the point of all this. Whether it's uh, colon cancer, which again, come on, I mean, the testing for that now. Uh, we've got some liquid biopsies. We've got some virtual testing. The standard is still something which, you know, I mean, the most hateful part of the process is the prep, you know, basically you spend all night with a pillow on the toilet yeah. after drinking something that makes you go to clear out the, 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 the orange the GI. Yeah, fluid yeah. or whatever it is. But come on, is, is this worth it? Because that's what age a you think way to go. Should we be, so we're all 40 now. Is that, should we be, go get in uh, the colon? Statistics show that uh, if you have a first degree relative that has one of these cancers in your family, go early, like 45. Otherwise, 50 seems to be the magic number okay. at which there's more yield for these tests because we're more likely to find something. Uh, that said, um, if you're a little high strung, like maybe all of us in this room, <laughs> yeah. you know, and it's keeping you up at night, which is what it was for me, like get tested earlier, you know, mm -hmm. whether it's a coronary CT angiogram, um, which goes to, to testing. That one is also misunderstood even by cardiologists because the idea is, oh, we don't want to want you to get irradiated. You guys might all be too young, but when I used to go to the dentist, okay, dental x-rays were limited to every five years. So they would ask you, well, Mr. McLean, uh, have you had dental x-rays in the last five years? Yeah, I think it was about three years ago. Okay, never mind. Come on back. We're going to clean your teeth. Nowadays, when you go to the dentist for your annual, they take you back. They don't ask you a question. They go back and they... Yeah. Cha-ching you for the for for the the X-rays because why there's not that much of an issue with the radiation like there used to be, and with a CT a coronary CT angiogram, you know they're doing these calcium scores, which is one pass about six to eight seconds through the the uh, the CT, and you're getting maybe uh, all you guys are probably getting six millisieverts of, of radiation right max, uh, actually less than that because that's just one pass so maybe half that. To make another pass, you're getting to six. Another six to eight seconds, you're getting six millisieverts of radiation. The maximum recommended annually is 55 mm -hmm. Where we live here, you guys, San Jose, you're getting maybe 3.5 millisieverts per year just being on the planet. And if you take an overseas trip, you're getting more than- uh, On the plane, right? Yeah, on the plane, right. So why would we not want to use that if it's something that could save your life? Particularly 
And I know this sounds backwards, but with athletes, I've had athletes that had 99, 98% blockage in their widow maker, the left anterior Ooh. descending. They were going fine. Ah, oh, you know what? God, I ate something bad last night. The wife, thank God, says, go to the ER. And they whisk them into the, the OR and they're getting stents. They're athletes, they can get away with it. Not everyone's that well conditioned and can get away with it like that. It's a no brainer. And I go back to, you know, the way we think. If it's keeping you up at night, get it done. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it's an extra pass compared to the, uh, what they call the coronary calcium score, which is worthless. Why? Because a calcium score, first of all, it's not that well correlated. I've had people that had zero calcium score, okay, but recently uh, happened to be a bodybuilder, 89% blockage in the left anterior descending because it's a softer fibrous plaque, which will kill you. That's the dangerous stuff. The calcified plaque is old news. The body says, okay, we've dealt with the inflammation. We walled it off. The immune system came, macrophages, cholesterol to the rescue. Now we're going to calcify it. Okay, we're done there. And you're not going to reverse it. So it's old news. And again, it's not correlated one way or the other. I had a coronary calcium score, I think it was like 32. Okay. What? I've done everything right. What? I, this is impossible. This is not rage. <coughs> right? And yet, again, because my brain was working overtime, worried about it when I did a coronary CT angiogram, squeaky clean otherwise. Thank goodness. But the point is, and we forget this, the screening is so important because you can get these things despite what you think you're doing right from A to Z, because something as simple as say an abscess tooth, okay, that goes unrecognized for a year or more, or a GI bug, something you don't have much control over, right? Unless you wanna live in a bubble, it's an infection. It goes throughout the blood. It could seed somewhere in the coronary arteries of the heart. You got inflammation oh, and bingo, you've done everything wow. right. Wow. And yet here you have this problem. As a matter of fact, for the three people I mentioned that I was thinking of, two of them had 98%, one had 99. I went back and looked at their labs, all three patients of mine. I was like, okay, how can this happen on my watch? What, 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 what's yeah. going on here? What did I do wrong? I, and I told you I'm a CPA before I'm a, a doctor, right? So I'm presumably honest and conservative. Every single one of their labs, LDL of, of 80, HDL of 60, plus or minus two points on either of those numbers for all three people. That's a cardiologist's dream. It, it was a previous infection, you think, huh? Well- First, I mean, we can go into a whole other subject about cholesterol and its effects or not. But mm. yeah, it had to be something different. In my case, again, I lived a pretty good life. I went back and I remember when I was too broke to be able to fix a tooth where the filling had fallen out and it started rotting away. It sounds gross, I know, but I was too broke to fix it. And all I could do was figure, yeah, I was in my 30s, must have been what seeded that little piece in my heart that finally, you know, when wow. I got the, the tooth fixed. Mm -hmm. My body got a got the upper hand on it. And that was that. Just to back you up, by the way, st studies are pretty clear on this that flossing reduces your risk of heart disease, probably because of that. Well, you pick up on a. I don't know if I devoted an entire chapter to it, but why we separate dental health from all the other uh, health? I mean, it's a specialty just like anything else, and it's huge for that reason. We all know, okay, you've heard of friends, if not you, oh yeah, he had a heart murmur, so he has to get uh, prophylactic antibiotics before he works. He yeah. has any dental work. Okay, there's a connection there. Yeah. We got to take great care of our mouth as well as our feet, our genitals, our heart, our liver, right? Otherwise, it can be a problem for that reason. Interesting. Well, yeah. Dr. Rand, always awesome talking to you. I think, yeah. uh, again, you're like the, you're our favorite person in this space, the person I think we will recommend the most. So for anybody listening- who The only to, one too, but that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For anybody who wants to learn about longevity and uh, you know being active and fit uh, for the rest of your life, this is the guy to go to. And your book is great. So well, thanks, thanks a lot. Thanks for coming thanks. on the show. No, thanks for having me as thanks, always, Tom. guys. It's more my pleasure. Right. Thank you. Today, we're going to teach you everything you need to know to build a strong, well-developed chest. When I think of you know, weak points and, and areas that I struggled with developing for a, a really long time, chest was up there with the- Yeah, it was for me. It was for me for sure. I got more caught up in the weight I could lift versus how I was developing my body. I think it's one of the most challenging muscles to develop for most people because the form and technique. 